I'm good. All right, our uh, first scripture reading for today is coming from Genesis. So if you have your Bible with you, I'd love for you to join along. Um, we're looking at Genesis chapter 12, and I'm going to be reading from verses 1 through 4. And this was uh, when God reached out to Abram before he even called him Abraham and gave him a promise. So Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second uh, reading for today is going to come from the book of Matthew, and I'm going to be reading from uh, chapter 28, verse 16 through 20. And many of you guys will be very familiar with this. This is the great commission that Jesus gave to us. That's Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him there, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of Christ for us, the people of God. Good morning, Saints of Orange. Good morning. It is a joy to see you this morning. Hey, there you go. I like that. This good work. Uh, before we get started, you received a piece of paper, an orange piece of paper, sort of a survey for us. We've had an interesting month together in this arrangement and, and in this uh, series. We want to know what your opinion of that is. Some of you have already filled that out and turned it in. We thank you for that. Those who have it, we invite you to, to fill it out. If you don't feel like you can do it during, uh, after service, you can do it at the end. during the week, turn it in. Or I'll be available here at the end of service if you want to turn it in to me. So we'll make sure it gets into the right hands. We, we really do want your opinion about it. We thank you for taking the time to do that. Well, it has been an uh, eventful month. We find ourselves at the end of our series where we've been looking at the truth of the Scriptures through the unique lens of the works of Dr. Seuss. Today, we find ourselves dealing with his last book, the last book he wrote while he was alive, entitled, Oh, The Places You'll Go. How many of you read that book? It's a very popular gift for graduates, I know. And it's a, there's a reason for that. Uh, it's a, a story about a journey. It's about the journey of life. And I think it's very appropriate on this last Sunday that in our text, we're dealing with what it means to live a life in Christ Jesus. That also is a journey. It is the journey of discipleship. Now, this traveling motif, if you will, is a rich motif from the Scriptures. We read about God going to Abram and Sarah and saying to them, Go to the land that I will show you. We read about God going to a stammering Moses and saying to him, Go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go free. We read of God through an angel appearing to the sleeping Joseph in a dream and warning him to get Mary and baby Jesus and go to Egypt to save themselves from King Herod's wrath. As Jesus walks along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Selecting his first disciples, he invites them to get up and go, leave your former lives, and follow after me. And in our text for this day, we also find some words for those of us on the journey of discipleship. And I think, looking at the motif, it's not too hard for us to discern what that's all about, is it? But we'll find out in just a moment. 
But as we consider what these words mean to those of us on this journey of discipleship, let's do so this morning through that unique lens that we've been talking about, the lens of the book by Dr. Seuss, Oh, the Places You'll Go. Congratulations! Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. So begins our book for this day. And in a sense, we hear that same sort of uh, sentiment echoed in Jesus' words. Now, as, as Jennings told us, those words have come to be known by most of us as the Great Commission. After Jesus' resurrection, after he spent some more time with, in fellowship and instruction with his disciples, he has finally come to the place and the time where he is going to leave, physically leave their presence and ascend to get to heaven. So in a very real sense, this is graduation day, if you will, for the disciples. They're going to have to continue this journey of discipleship without the visible, fleshly presence of Jesus. And so it's in this moment, in this scary, momentous moment, that Jesus speaks some words to them, words that we need to hear. Commissioning, instructing, and encouraging them as they go along this journey. And as we consider what those words mean to us this morning, there are some things you and I need to hear from them if we wish to journey well, if you will. Now what do you mean, Ken? I'm glad you asked. To begin with, we need to hear very clearly in the words of Jesus, His command to us to go. Go. In our book, we read, you have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. Now it's pretty clear from that that the hero of our story is expected to be a person on the moon. He's not going to get to his life. He's not going to get where he wants to go by standing still. He's got to go. And so it is for our journey of discipleship. As those who are seeking to follow after Jesus, we need to understand this discipleship thing is not a static event or activity. Rather, it's dynamic. You and I are expected not to be content just to stand still where we are in our spiritual development, in our relationship with God. We are expected to continue to move forward daily, growing in the knowledge and the love of God. We're called not to just stay where we are in our little cubicle. We're called to get out into the world, to live, really live, real life in the midst of real people. J. Ken Edwards in his work, No Antiseptic Evangelism, talks about a really interesting educational tool that I, I found really fascinating. There is a software company called Digital Frog International. And they are creating a software program or they have created a software program that will allow people to dissect frogs without, well, dissecting frogs. Anybody ever do that in biology? Yeah. With the point and the click of a mouse now on a computer program, you can dissect a frog. You don't have to deal with formaldehyde and all the other lovely things that come with that. And while that certainly, I'm sure, is saving on frogs and on squeamish students, it's rather antiseptic, it's rather distant, don't you think? Regardless of what you think of that as an educational tool, being able to remote control, dissect, we can't live our lives of discipleship on remote control. We can't live a removed, antiseptic life of discipleship. You and I have been called to get out into the midst of it, opening our lives and sharing in the lives of other people. And I'm telling you right now, brothers and sisters, sometimes that's really 
messy work. But that's where the road of discipleship takes us. That's where our Lord has called us, not to stay, but to go. And it's interesting here, both in the, the text from, uh, from the Old Testament where God's speaking to Abraham, and here again when Jesus is talking to the disciples, this is not a polite request. If we were to translate this into the southern language, it would be equivalent to, Get up on that hill! <laughs> you might hear that? You might say that. This is, there you go. this is emphatic. This is emphatic. He doesn't say to the disciples, Now look guys, if you're not too busy, if it's not too much trouble, if the weather's nice, and if you don't have anything else to do, if you feel like it, maybe you'll want to, to go out there and try to, to live a life of a disciple. He says, go. Go! Go! If that means your road of discipleship leads you into uh, foreign missions, guess what? You better go. If it means your road leads you to ordain ministry, you better get going. If it means in the midst of your everyday life, your path takes you to a place where you've got to feed the hungry, visit those in prison, love the least, last, and the lost with all your heart, guess what? You better go. We cannot stand still in life. We'd like to. Some of us might like to take a couple steps back. That doesn't happen. Life doesn't stand still, and we cannot stand still in the path of discipleship. We have been commanded to go. We also need to hear very clearly in Jesus' words the calling we receive, the calling to make disciples. Now in the book, our young hero is expected to join with others of like mind as they pursue excellence, as they pursue their lives. Part of the, the, the book reads this way. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high high. And while some people would look at that and look at the, the gist of the book and think that it's a little self-serving in its writing, in other words, you've got to look out after yourself, the truth of the matter is there is a little bit of this soaring thinking going on in Jesus' words. He too is telling us we're expected to soar. We're expected to join other like-minded high flyers in this journey of discipleship, but not just for our benefit. We're to specifically join for the purpose of mentoring, instructing, and encouraging other people to join us in this pathway. You and I have specifically been called to make disciples in the name of Jesus. Now, if you've been to church at all, anytime, anywhere in the last little bit, you've heard that a few times. Well, that's not the disciples. Well, what does that mean? As part of the, the church, the Orange Church's mission statement, we're to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. As part of the United Methodist Church's mission statement. Sounds great, but what does it mean? Well, does it mean, Ken, that we're supposed to bring Jesus to the lives of other people, to bring the church to the lives of other people? Well, maybe. Let's think about that. I came across a Reuters News Service article written a few years back entitled, World's First Inflatable Church Open to Public. Michael Gill is a British entrepreneur who wanted to solve the problem of getting some more British people going to church, something that they seem to be avoiding in large numbers now. So he decided after some research that if they would not come to church, the church would come to them. So he created a fully inflatable sanctuary, 47 feet tall, complete with an inflatable altar and arches. Any, any pastor that wants to gets one of those, can load it up in a truck, drive to where the people are, unload in a matter, a short matter of time, inflate that church, and they have a church right there among the folks. Interesting idea, don't you think? 
The idea of a bouncy house church, you know, some of that sounds fun. It might be a pretty good evangelism tool, but the truth of the matter is, the task of making disciples, our calling, it's a little more involved than that. You see, it's not enough for God's people to come up with clever gimmicks that will temporarily draw people's attention to the Word of God before they're immediately distracted again by the shiny baubles of the world. You see, real disciple-making happens when we get down in the trenches of life. When we open ourselves up and share our lives and share in the lives of other people in their trials and tribulations. And in the process, begin to form relationships. That's where disciple-making occurs in the midst of the nitty-gritty. And we do that not because of any gimmicks, not because somebody can give us a box program in three easy steps you can do this. We don't do it because we want to be the biggest church. We don't do it because we want to be classified as the best disciple maker. We do the making of disciples because we do it out of love. We've experienced God's love in Christ Jesus, and that means so much to us that we love others so much that we want them to know what we've come to know. We do it because of love. The Week magazine in June of 2006 carried an article that talked about the historic first ascent to the top of Mount Everest made by Sir Edmund Hillary and his Sherpa Tenzig Norgay. This took place in 1953. From 1953 to 2006, when that article was written, 2,700 other people had fall, followed in their footsteps. Some of them paying very uh, dearly for the opportunity, upwards of $60,000 per expedition, just for a chance to make it to the top of Everest. And this commercialization of this great feat has caused an erosion in the ethical code of the mountaineer. Because they've spent so much money, because they've trained, because they want to get to the top so badly, they are willing to pass by. Many climbers are willing to pass by an injured or sick climber because they've got to make it to the top themselves. It's caused some casualties. David Stark was one such casualty. In March of 2006, this businessman from Cleveland made it to the top. But on his way back down, he ran out of oxygen. As he lay there dying, 40 people passed him by. Too intent on their desire to make it to the top to stop and help a dying man. David Stark ended up freezing to death. This prompted Sir Edmund Hillary to remark in disgust, on my expedition, there was no way you'd have left a man behind to die under a rock. Brothers and sisters, as we try to hurry down the road of life to get to our life, as we are eager and intent to get on down the road of discipleship for ourselves, we are passing every day people who are in danger Amen. of spiritual death. People who are reaching out for help. Do we love them enough to stop and help? Or are we just too intent on getting to where we want to be? I think Jesus' words are pretty clear on this. We're called to stop to reach out to help. We've been called not to be the first, not to make it ourselves. We've been called to reach out and make disciples in the name of Jesus. We also need to very clearly hear from the words of our Lord His comforting promise of His presence. The comfort of our Lord's presence with us. Both our book and our text have a very upbeat, optimistic air about them, but both of them also have a hint either implicitly or explicitly they let us know that, you know what, life is not always all sweetness in life. In the book, we read this. I love this line from this book. 
I'm sorry to say this, but sadly it's true, that hang-ups and bang-ups can happen to you. Isn't that true? Our young hero then has to go through a lurch. Anybody ever had a lurch? And then a swamp. Oh, yes. And then he has to go somewhere called the waiting place. Oh, we spent a little bit of time there. And then he finds himself in that place where he's all alone, where he's got to deal with his problems by himself, in that place where the hacking cracks howl. In the words of Jesus in our text, we hear an undercurrent, if you will, that reminds us that life within the kingdom of God, life on the journey of discipleship, is not always sweetness in life. There are moments and circumstances that are difficult indeed. Let's be honest. It's hard to go out into a world in the name of Jesus when they are hostile to the message we have for them. It's hard to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world when they're turned off immediately when you say anything of a religious nature. There are times on this path we're going to go through the valley of fear, the veil of sorrow, a time of tears, a mountain of regret and frustration. But in those moments, the big difference between us and our hero, and it is a big difference. The big difference is we are not alone. We're not alone. We have the comforting presence of the community of faith who travels with us on this journey of discipleship. But more importantly, we have the assurance in his own words of Jesus presence with us. Did you hear what he said? And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. You're not alone. He's with you every step of the way. Good news. Many of you know that my daughter Ingrid is on a study tour in Shanghai, in China, halfway around the world. It's been a very rewarding experience for her in many respects, but there have also been times of fear and loneliness, not just for her parents. And you parents who've let your youngins go out into the world, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? It's tough when you can't reach out and touch them. And it's tough for them, too. Times, I'm sure, when they feel like they're by themselves. But in those moments, I want to tell you right now, and I, I guess I'm advertising for them, Skype is wonderful. <laughs> huh? It's been great to be able to make that contact, to remind each other, hey, we haven't forgot about each other. Your church family is praying for you, and most importantly, God is with you. You're okay. It's going to be all right. Even if you don't speak the language completely fluently. That's good news. In those moments when you and I are going through that place where the hack and cracks howl, we've heard of heaven. How comforting it is for us to turn in prayer and to hear within our spirit those words from our Lord. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I don't care how you cut that, brothers and sisters, that's good news. Congratulations! Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So, get on your way. That's how the book ends. On a happy note, and I think that's how the Gospel of Matthew ends. It's on a happy, optimistic note. You see, you and I have been receiving an invitation. We've been invited by Jesus to join Him on a journey of discipleship. We're to go out into the world in His name. And even while we grow ourselves, we're called to reach out to others in His name. To make disciples through building relationships with people. And as we do that, we go with the assurance and the empowerment and the encouragement of knowing that Jesus is with us always. From here to eternity.
as you and I make our way down this journey of discipleship this morning, I hope you'll be able to hear, as I hear in my spirit, our Lord's encouragement to us as He says to us, smiling, Oh, oh, the places you'll go. Thanks be to God for His word to us this day. Well, it comes to the end of the way. It's an interesting month. Sam I Am taught us about how unique we are in the Christian life. We learned from Yertle, you need to get the things of your life in the right order. Zach's reminded us that, uh, you know, sometimes you've got to change things up. You've got to be able to forgive. Today we've been reminded that our discipleship is a, a journey. It's a thing that we're going down the road together. Most of all, we go in the strength and the power and the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we go forth, I say to you in the name of Jesus Christ, oh, the places you'll go for Him. It's in that spirit I say now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace.